Welcome back to Strange Form. Today we will be looking at Hyatoy's entire Xenomorph film collection. Every alien they ever released from the original Alien all the way to Covenant and every AVP in between. Totaling one newborn, two sets of eggs, two pred-aliens, four queens, and 20 xenomorphs. That's right, 29 alien film figures have been released by Haya over the last four years. Starting with the first film, we have the original Big Chap himself, as well as a clutch of six alien eggs and facehuggers. The Big Chap comes with two different styles of packaging, the regular window box design, and the GameStop exclusive card back figure that comes in a large window box, both packaging types paying tribute to the original Kenner alien design and color scheme. Beyond the packaging though, there is zero difference between these two figures. Strangely enough, the carded figure was released as part of a 35th anniversary celebration of the second film. Every window box figure comes with a postcard sized insert. These don't differ from figure to figure, but they are unique to each film, i.e. there's a different picture for Alien, and then Aliens, and Aliens vs. Predator, and so on. I find this little chap to be great for the miniature size, and it came in at number 10 on my top 10 Alien Big Chap figures list. Like most Hyatoys, the joints can be a little difficult to get into proper position, and some warping may cause you to run for the hairdryer in order to get things ironed out. But all in all, this is a neat little figure, managing to get little details like the inner mouth coloration correct where some other companies couldn't be bothered. The eggs are semi-translucent and highly detailed with a nice wet look, each coming with its own individual facehugger. The sculpts for the eggs are too closed, two semi-open with the membrane on top still intact, and two empty. The translucent plastic is a surprisingly accurate representation of the film egg, considering the size, each one having the ability to house one of the three facehugger types, which are running, jumping, and hugging. The only thing missing here is something that is missing from the entire line as a whole, a chestburster. Next up, James Cameron's Aliens. Sporting the most alien figures in any of Haya's individual film offerings, the creatures in James Cameron's enormous sequel to Ridley Scott's masterpiece are a subtle departure in both form and behavior. In celebrating Stan Winston's take on the titular character, we have the 35th anniversary GameStop exclusive green alien warrior. I don't know what the thinking on this one was other than can we sell a green one, but the card artwork does showcase the art of Dark Horse Comics Alien Series 2, issue number 2 by Dennis Bove. And if you haven't read these comics, I highly suggest you do, especially the first three series, as they are superior to almost anything after the first three films, and were most likely the jumping off point for Neil Blokamp's cancelled Alien 5 project. Other than the color scheme, there is nothing different about this figure, other than it might get you back to Oz. Next, the GameStop exclusive Battle Damaged Alien Warrior set. As with the last one, these are identical to their single packaged counterparts, with one important distinction. They come with sentry guns. Yes, that's right, the sentry guns seen in the special edition of Aliens. I remember the first time I saw the extended edition on TV, and even as a child, I could not believe the sentry gun sequence was cut from the film. I understand cutting the derelict ship from the beginning to preserve tension, but because of that sentry gun scene, I almost never watched the theatrical version of Aliens, and almost always start with that one when first showing it to my children. And when you look at these exploding alien sculpts, you can almost hear the squealing cry of the creatures amongst rhythmic chaotic automatic weapons fire, all as the ammo counters draw ever closer to zero. I definitely find the two-pack to be the superior release of the battle-damaged warriors, and appreciate Haya's love for the property in releasing something like this. Here we have the three alien warriors and the alien egg set. First off, the postcard for Aliens is probably the least interesting of the entire line, featuring a blacked-out center with swirls and structures similar to that found in the alien hive underneath the atmospheric processing plant, so an okay backdrop, but the other figures have images that are almost like trading cards. This is where we see a departure from the original film. The biomechanical look is still intact, but Stan Winston's rendition of the creature is decidedly more insect-like, with changes made to the forearms, hands, feet, and tail. And these are not the only changes in the film. Even the chestbursters in Cameron's Aliens are slightly different than the one we found bursting out of Kane, having arms from birth rather than at the first molting. 
But the most obvious difference is of course the ridged head, and there are many explanations for this, but the one I like most is that they eventually lose the dome upon successive moltings, and the creatures in Cameron's Aliens are actually the oldest we ever see in the film series. But there are other explanations as well, such as these are warriors rather than drones and genetic differences between outbreaks. The first two alien figures are simply taking a cue from Hot Toys and NECA in having a blue lighting version and a brown true costume version. But the third figure is probably the most interesting of the bunch, and one necessitated by the fact that Haya has limited articulation options on the figure at this size. The brown and blue versions being sculpted into an upright standing position, the third figure's neck and head and back spine are sculpted into a crouching and crawling position, proving Haya actually understands the troop-building nature of diorama collectors. The eggs follow the same open, semi-open, and closed design as the previous iterations, but are a completely different sculpt, adequately capturing the look and feel of the eggs found in the queen's nest. The facehuggers themselves are pretty much exactly the same, but this is also true of the two films. Now as for Haya's queen. If you have been following the channel, you've probably already seen that I have reviewed this figure twice before, once in its own review, and once as part of an every Haya Queen comparison. So if you want an in-depth review, please see one of those. But what I will say is that Haya has definitely captured the look and feel of the creature, and I think that Stan Winston created one of the most unique monsters ever to be put on film, and set the bar in 1986 so high that special effects artists and filmmakers are still trying to hurdle themselves over it. So this brings me to a question for the comments section. Who would you nominate as the next Stan Winston? With every successive film after Alien 3, the Xenomorph became more and more organic, leading to monsters that felt more like raptors from Jurassic Park than something that was difficult to make heads or tails of when hiding among the ship's machinery. Which brings us to Alien 3 the last xenomorph H.R. Giger would have a direct hand in designing. The creature from Alien 3 was decidedly sleeker and more panther-like without sacrificing the bony design and biomechanical tubing. Whether you believe the creature in Alien 3 was the product of a dog or ox, or, or as I do, a Praetorian guard designed to protect the gestating queen, there is no arguing that David Fincher's rendition is, save for the newborn, the largest departure from the original design in the whole series, from the human-like lips to the slim build, to the lack of any tubes or spines on the back, all the way to the crooked hawk of the rear leg, the dragon plaguing the prisoners of Fury 161, ironically having burst from a dog, was much more cat-like than anything seen before. Returning to the translucent dome and six-fingered design of the first film, the creature was no longer solely bipedal, but seen both standing up on its hind legs and running on all fours. And this is where Haya was smart to create both states of the creature. My only major complaint here is that I wish that Haya had also done the Bambi Burster, the creature that made women everywhere question whether or not they were monsters to find it cute after watching what it did to that dog. And this brings us to the end of the Alien Quadrilogy, the very French Alien Resurrection. Famous for films like Delicatessen, Amelie, and City of Lost Children, Jean-Pierre Jeanette's take on the Alien universe was about as jarring as watching Joel Schumacher take over Batman, which is why I've never felt Resurrection was a true Alien sequel, from the fact that the aliens in it are human crossbreeds, to the constant need for the film to break up any serious moments with sarcastic jokes. This film felt more like Tales from the Alien Universe than a true sequel, and that's where I choose to enjoy it, for what it is, rather than what it could have been. Aside from the chicken legs, this is the basic design we will see carried through both Aliens vs. Predator and Requiem. Here they got rid of the dorsal spine, brought the four tubes back, and gave the whole thing a more muscular, organic look. Except for the legs, this is the exact same sculpt you're going to get with all four of the Aliens vs. Predator figures. As for the newborn, I think that this is a good sculpt, as good as you can get with a character that has floppy breasts, a giant vagina, and a face that looks like grandma did too much meth. The rumors I had heard about the newborn was that originally it was supposed to be a way of the queen expelling all of the human DNA, and that its pot belly was pregnant with a pure alien egg, and that there was supposed to be a sequence where the ship landed on Earth and the crew had to chase the thing through the catacombs of Paris as it tried to find a place to lay that egg. And though I know some of these aspects are true, some of them may just be wishful thinking on behalf of the internet. Which brings us to Haya's cloned alien queen. This is definitely a cash grab, as the queen was never seen upright in the film. 
I think it would have been cool if they gave us a reclining queen with a giant pregnant stomach. But both Neca and Haya decided to just paint her brown and give us a different box. Not terrible, but also not different enough to justify its existence. And now we skip over Prometheus and re-enter the franchise at Alien Covenant. Which is disappointing, because Haya has come close to having every film representation of the creature less the Deacon. And I say this as someone who didn't really like Prometheus, other than thinking that it was visually spectacular. As a matter of fact, I think that Ridley Scott's return to the franchise, an enlistment of Damon Lindelof as a script doctor, has done more damage to the alien lore than any other writer or director. And unfortunately, at least for me, Covenant doubles down on these mistakes. That being said, I think that Haya did an okay job with both the Neomorph and Protoxenomorph. The Neomorph looking like the offspring of a forbidden relationship between Jacques Cousteau and a beluga whale, but with butthole lips, and the Protoxenomorph looking like an awkward, skinny, teenage years big chap. Both figures call forth the film's counterparts fairly accurately, though again, no transparent dome in favor of painted on stripes. Also included in the package is a checklist for Haya's Colonial Marines figures. I never did pick up any of these, largely because I'm not a huge fan of the very video gamey creature design. I understand that Variety keeps level design fresh and interesting, but Alien Isolation managed to keep the whole thing engaging with only one creature. Parts of Colonial Marines felt more like a generic zombie game, i.e. Left for Dead, than trying to survive an onslaught from the perfect organism. I have eyed that APC several times, though. My hope is that someday Haya gives us Cameron's Colonial Marines and maybe a few more members of the Nostromo. Now we move on to the wonderful world of Aliens vs. Predator. As standalone films, these are fun, but they fit in the established Alien universe about as well as Benedict Cumberbatch playing Khan Noonien Singh. I mean, he looks exactly like Ricardo Montepon. Nailed it. This subject has always been a depressing one for me. Ever since I first saw the alien skull on the trophy wall in Predator 2, I wanted to see this concept brought to life. And the Dark Horse comic book was the perfect roadmap for what they should have done. It can't have been that much more expensive to have the film set on a colony world rather than below an Antarctic whaling station. But it is what it is. And until we get the inevitable reboot, we must enjoy it for the ultimate monster bash we got. Haya gave us a standard xenomorph, a battle-damaged figure, the grid alien with the tip of his tail cut off, and the predator vision figure, which is actually the most fun to look at. You can almost hear the wishing sound of the predator's mask targeting the creature. Unfortunately, other than the predator vision figure, these are all extremely soft in both detail and paint scheme, making them the least striking of the line. However, it would not be hard to detail these and bring them to a higher standard. I have seen many of the Predator figures in person, and these are definitely the stars of Haya's first AVP line. Though there is another contender, as we also got two new Alien Queen figures, both standard and battle damaged. And though NECA is the champion for the most prolific curated collection of Xenomorphs, even they haven't given us an AVP Queen. Currently, Haya's only competitors are the Hot Toys Snap figure, and McFarlane's original miniature line. In my opinion, the Queen's attack at the end was the highlight of the first Aliens vs. Predator film. Seeing the Queen tear through the abandoned whaling station like a huge angry T-Rex was a striking visual, and the Dutch angle where the Predator flies out of nowhere and plunges a spear into her neck was one of the better standalone sequences of the entire franchise. Unfortunately, the creators of the film were not content to simply give us the previous Queen, but give us an older, meaner-looking version covered in ridges and spines, and Haya followed suit, giving us not one, but two renditions of this queen. The battle damage version, not being content to just have green paint splashed all over her, actually has quite a bit of new sculpt detail. My only two issues with these figures are that in the film, her feet had her toes splayed out more like a T-Rex, rather than the sort of tiptoe high heel look Stan Winston's original had. And the scale. The scale is not at all film accurate. The queen in AVP was supposed to be 20 to 30 percent larger than the original, so these don't display as well with the other figures. And now we come to the end of our journey with Haya's three Aliens vs. Predator Requiem figures, which includes the Pred-Alien, a standard alien warrior, and a battle-damaged Pred-Alien. Though the body was primarily the same as was seen in Resurrection in the first Alien vs. Predator film, the head design was definitely trying to call back James Cameron's sequel. Unfortunately, this was an aesthetic choice that didn't make much sense, as the creatures from the previous film, who share a direct lineage with these, all had domed heads. So the change was a little bit nonsensical. The Pred-Alien itself leans heavily on the shared genetic information with the host concept. 
almost portraying the hybrid as more predator than alien. But it's definitely a striking design, and Haya has done an excellent job recreating the aggressive angles of this thing. And between this, the Hot Toys version, and the NECA version, Haya's is actually the most satisfying to pose. Whatever your view is on Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, the creature designs were not at all terrible. From the intimidating dual shoulder cannon wielding wolf predator to the ridged head of the xenomorph, all the way to the Predator Queen hybrid, AVPR was trying to add something new to the franchise and managed to capture the eye of the collector's market in doing so. In the end, these are fun figures from a flawed Midnight Monster movie that nearly ended the entire franchise. Now I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you haven't already, consider being a part of our community by getting involved in the comment section, liking, and subscribing for future content. And as always, remember, never stop collecting.